Hey everybody, P. Dave Turner, executive producer and host of the Break It Down show, coming at you with today's intro for Dr. Andrew Friedman. Now, Andy is a friend. We've been on the show together several times, once with Dave West as a co-host and once with Paul Demeck as a co-host. And Andy is a cosmologist at UCSD, UC San Diego. He studies, well, he did one thing called the Cosmic Bell Test. And there's actually a special on NOVA about that. You can see what he and his peers did to try to determine the laws of quantum physics and and try to disprove what Einstein said and prove what uh, Niels Bohr said. Gosh, I hope I get those names right. I think I have. I'm going off of memory here. Either way, uh, there was a big, huge, very smart people conversation about 120 years ago. And, and they were trying to figure out the scientific world. And Einstein said one thing and Bohr said another. And then that led to the cosmic bell test, which in Bell's a different guy 50 years later. Definitely interesting stuff. What we're going to do today, though, instead of discussing just straight up quantum anything, is we're going to see if we can bridge the gap between quantum mechanics, quantum theory, and religion and God. And see what happens with that. This isn't meant to proselytize or anything like that. It's just a bunch of dudes exploring a topic that is fascinating when you start to get to the point where science and God, I guess you would call it for you know, lack of a better term, when those things intersect and you start to lose track of which is which and can't explain why one is there and, and the other one isn't. So I think it's a real neat conversation. Scott Husing joins me as a co-host. It's always fun to run Scott through these impossible conversations because it's just, well, it's just a good time, and he's a good sport about it, and it turns out he loved the conversation. So he goes in uh, a little intimidated by it, and uh, watch what happens the whole first half of the episode. He loves it. Hey, listen, supporting the show, it's an important thing for us. It helps me out to go out and take it to market. So when you like, when you share, when you comment, when you tell a friend, uh, just you know, take a show, take one next week, and just recommend it to a friend and say, hey, would you do me a favor? And that, that's what I'm asking for today. Just would you do me a favor and listen to this show? Tell me what you think of it. See if you like it. That, I think that's it. That, that'll be that. And then Save the Brave, savethebrave.org. Click on the Donate tab, drop in a small amount of money for each month, and know that you're helping keep veterans alive. We just had the guys out the other night doing some fishing. I think they went for lobster. And it's these moments that we look forward to that we're able to get together and bond and realize there's something actually worth living for. That's what that money goes towards is saving lives. If that's part of your personal charter, by all means, let's do it. If you're not sure what to do, charity on top. Give a friend some charity. Let them pick. Those are great ways to support things. I ask all of you to look at how you do things, what you're doing, and where you can dig a little deeper and do something for somebody else. All right. Enough of that. It's Friday. Everybody have a great weekend. Here comes Andrew Friedman. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. This Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Friedman, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. CSD once again about to have my mind exploded and I thought it'd be fun to explode Scott's brain too. Always. We were talking about our man Andy who worked on the cosmic bell test. You guys can see that. Is that Nat Geo or is that Nova? What is it? They made a documentary uh, on the, the PBS uh, show Nova. Nova. Which, which yeah. yeah aired uh, early last year called Einstein's Quantum Riddle. That was about uh, the experiment that my colleagues and I did uh, in the Canary Islands testing something fundamental about uh, quantum mechanics and quantum entanglement. Yeah. And the last time I was here, I was kind of snoodling around with you on this. And I said, wait, is there quantum gravity? And you said, yes. And then I'm like, all right. Hey, this is P. Dave Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org. Click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, and the last time I was here, I was kind of snoodling around with you on this, and I said, wait, is there quantum gravity? And you said, yes. And then I'm like, all right.
you know, I still don't know what to do with that. You know, like we don't know how gravity works. We know things are likely to be entangled. We know that we have to give up freedom of choice and location as part of this. And I forget what the third element was, but I'm just like all these things. There's a lot of esoteric stuff when you're getting into the, the foundations of, uh, you know, the, the basic physical theories that, uh, you know, we, we understand in, in physics. Yeah. So, you know, when you're talking about, you know, quantum mechanics, which governs the subatomic world, uh, you know, atoms, you know, electrons, photons, the smallest elements of reality that we know about. And then on the other hand, you have general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity, which governs large systems like planets, stars, right. galaxies, and even the entire history of the universe and, and how it expands and, and uh, how all the forces interplay. Uh, but uh, the, the subject of quantum gravity is kind of the frontier mm. of physics where we don't know how to get quantum mechanics and general relativity to play nice together in certain areas where they overlap so that we know there has to be something more. We know that neither of them is the final theory of everything. And one way to kind of tackle that, that question, what we've done is we've, we've tried to look into the foundations of, of quantum theory and look into, uh, you know, the weird phenomenon of entanglement, which you talked about on previous shows. Yeah. I think we should set the stage though, too, for the listeners who are out there. Yeah. So we're at UCSD, University of California, San Diego, right by our, our, our house. And we're on campus milling about a bunch of young millennials. And Pete, I don't know how you meet all these people uh -huh. or how these introductions work. It's a strange network, a quantum Turner network or whatever that <laughs> people are connected. It's, it's crazy. And then he, you, you told me about this show. And again, I'm a little in over my head thinking, oh man, this is going to, I'm just going to be a fly on the wall. But yeah. again, when you meet, people and you walk into their natural habitats we go into the science building here at surf and uh you know you look at andy's computer it's this tiny little computer screen no it's like the size of a fucking whiteboard it, and it is a little bit ridiculous there's all kinds of <laughs> and it's got a little buddy <laughs> there's all yes. kinds of mathematical stuff going on in a narrative and text which is mind-blowing in and of itself but i think the the interesting part is is pete knows is pete's way smarter than me by the way <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, we're both storytellers, but I love the human element of it too. And when we walk in, like you're automatically like, what are you all about? And asking questions about us, which is something that most people don't get. Cause they get a little gun shy at times, I think to stick their toe in a, this pool of water yeah. and then to find out, you know, it, it, you know, and he starts talking about, yeah, I was in, you know, MIT and this is my background and my wife's a criminal defense attorney. And, uh, you know, it's all again, like most people self proclaimed and proud nerd as you stated absolutely earlier the question i had to pete before all this happened is is andy going to be able to explain to the listeners what it is that you guys talked about and pete gave me a great analogy at lunch using three cups of marinara sauce uh water and some parmesan cheese so yeah. And I still forgot one of the things. I knew proximity <laughs> and I knew freedom of choice, but I still couldn't remember. Like, it doesn't matter. It's something super obvious that you would not want to surrender. But I was able to explain, you know, these things shouldn't be connected, yet we can't disprove it. Yeah, we how, can't say that. How do you explain it to the guy who graduated high school with a 1.24 GPA and went to Illinois State? <laughs> you know, to that listener out there, me. So we can cover some of that ground that we've covered yeah, in yeah, previous yeah. Uh, Just, podcasts for sure. So, so, I mean, I guess backing up. So uh, quantum entanglement is this weird phenomenon where if you have a pair of particles and I send one off to you, one off to Pete, and he measures some property of his particle, he instantly knows something about the, a future measurement on your particle, no matter how far apart they are, no matter how long ago they became entangled. Basically, an entangled system is a system that cannot be described as like, you know, independent things. So when things are entangled, they're correlated with each other. There's the the joint state of the combined system of the two particles, but you can't really talk about each individual particle. We've done experiments over many years, and the phenomenon has been uh, dramatically demonstrated in the laboratory. So it's a real thing. So that we're trying to figure out uh, what is an explanation for it. How does you know why why does it actually work? And you know, on, on the one hand, we have quantum mechanics, which is you know our, our a theory which does predict entanglement. But Albert Einstein, amongst others. Uh, you know, back in the 1930s, thought that quantum mechanics had to be incomplete, especially because of things like entanglement. To him, it looked like when Pete's measuring his particle, somehow some instantaneous influence is propagating over to you. And, and Einstein uh, is very famous for his theory of relativity, which says that 
no information can travel faster than the speed of light. Now, now in, in modern understanding, we don't actually think that when Pete measures his particle, your particle state actually changes. We think that it's knowledge and information that's updated in instantly. But there's still some weird, it's not causation that's propagating instantly, but correlation that's changing in a weird way. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance entanglement because he, hmm. he, he, he thought it was absurd and that it was pointing towards uh, quantum mechanics couldn't be a complete theory of the world. So when Einstein was trying to think about alternatives, he was thinking about alternatives that were more like the everyday physics, Newtonian physics, the kind of stuff that we learned in high school. So, so there, are, there, are, there are a few different properties of the world that Einstein wanted to be true. You know, one of them is called locality. So it's the idea that things can only influence each other if they, if they bump into each other or if they send a, a message uh, at, a, at the speed of light or slower. The speed of light is the maximum speed that any information can travel. And he also wanted the world to, to be um, realist in the sense that he wanted particles and, and things to have d definite states all the time no matter whether we were looking at them, measuring them, or whatever. In quantum mechanics, that, that is kind of cast into doubt. And another thing which kind of came to light later, which was kind of implicit in Einstein's reasoning, is that experimenters should be free to choose what measurements they're making. So when Pete has an entangled particle, and you have one, and let's say you're measuring the, the polarization of a photon, like, like you have polarized sunglasses and you're rotating them at some angle, that changes whether the photon goes through or not. And... Basically, that's what an entanglement experiment looks like with photons, where you each are orienting your sunglasses at different angles, so to speak. They're not really sunglasses, but things that are like that. Mm -hmm. you, you count uh, how often the answers line up in certain ways. And um, in quantum mechanics, they can line up um, with, with, with correlations that uh, exceed, um, in, in, a, in a surprising way, the kind of correlations that... Uh, would it be possible if the world was more like what Einstein wanted to be true? So it's been experimentally verified, but we are still kind of looking into ways that poking at the cracks to, to see if, if there's any way that something like what Einstein wanted to be true is still possible. And if you look at those various assumptions about the world, locality, realism, and freedom, it turns out that if, if the world doesn't actually obey some of those, that can still allow for um, a worldview that's different than quantum mechanics to explain the weird things we see in entanglement. So we work on experiments to try to push those boundaries. As someone that gets paid as a, as a researcher, you're not teaching, right? You don't have a class load or anything like that. You're solely focused on... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm funded by grants, and, but I don't have teaching responsibilities day to day. And, and you've been doing this for so long, pretty much your whole life. You went from academia back into academia and now in researching. Let me ask you this with all that I know about you right now is, do you find as a researcher more gratification in this job, this career path in life that you've chosen about asking questions or getting the answers to questions? Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's a great question in and of itself. It's interesting because the, the there's no scientific formula for what questions should I ask about the world or what should I be interested in? You know, and th those are subjective preferences. And I, I feel super lucky that I've been able to, in many cases, be, have the freedom to come up with some of those questions myself in collaboration with, with others. And it's, I, I think that there are some questions that if you're, if you're being honest, it's really hard to get a definitive answer. I mean, in science, there's always uncertainty. Uh, and the, there, there are always other things that you might not have thought of yet. A and the, the way that scientific knowledge accumulates is, is by usually progressively small steps. And, and so the work that we've done is, is we're trying to illuminate the question of how can we explain quantum entanglement in a way that makes sense? And, and, I, and I would not say that we have gotten the answer, but being able to uh, approach the question in a fresh way has been really fun. And, and, and in particular, what we decided to do is instead of uh, letting things on Earth make the measurement choices on the entangled particles in our experiment, we outsourced that to the universe. So we pointed telescopes up at distant stars in our own galaxy, and then later on, distant galaxies called quasars. And we used the, the color of the light that was coming from those quasars that's been on its way for billions of years. Like a random number generator, if it was like red or blue, we would either keep our measurement setting the same or change it for the entangled particles. 
we basically outsource the choice of, of measurement to the universe. And it's just been really fun as a researcher to be, to be you know, able to be somebody who helped think of that idea you, with colleagues. Who do, you try and, who do you try and grab the answers to those questions for when you're, when you're doing all this? You're like, oh, God, I can't wait to tell the public this. Because one of the, one of the things I was talking to Pete at lunch about, too, before we came in was, you know, most people think here, planetary. You're thinking galactic, intergalactic spatial relationships. But what matters most to human animals is how, how does it affect me? Sure. How do you explain that to me and, and what you do here, all the information you gather and the answers you're going to provide me? How, how, what does it mean to me? So I think that science is for everyone. Science is for every human being on the planet. It is not just for some elite group of people you know, who live in an ivory tower. And it, it is so important to how we understand the world and how we make choices in the world. And, and so, so, you know, th there are lots of extremely esoteric ideas in science like this. And there are, but there are a surprisingly large number of people who actually are interested in it, especially when you're dealing with things in, in astronomy and cosmology. And if you're talking about the history of the universe, if you're talking about uh, the creation of the universe, what's going to happen in the far future, how did life come to exist? You know, as I think we can get into a little bit later, it actually affects, uh, in many ways, the the way people think of religion and spirituality yeah, in in terms of we our place in talk, the. We're going to talk about that this episode. So yeah, so how, so, how those two are intertwined? Absolutely. So so I, I guess I guess I would say that that uh, it's really easy on the face of it to think that these things don't matter to you. You know, to be fair, everybody, you don't have to get a PhD in something to appreciate it. That there's there's so much you can learn by reading the popular science uh, journalism and books and and TV shows and, that, and podcasts that are out there these days. There's so many ways to to get good, fun scientific information about the world. But but more important than than a specific topic like entanglement, which is you know very very interesting to me, is the whole scientific worldview. It's it's how we how we figure out what's true in our world. How we figure out that we're not fooling ourselves like what is the ground truth mm -hmm. you know in, in order to to build all this technology that's surrounding us these these ridiculously large screens which are you know you know all around this office we needed to understand how to use quantum mechanics and by some estimates 30 to 40 percent of the gdp of the world is based on tech you know technologies which re require quantum mechanics you're talking about lasers you know computer processors telecommunications and even more important than, than the applications is how we use the scientific process to figure out what's really true in the world, how we correct for our own biases, how we cope with the fact that we're always uncertain about things. Science in popular culture often has this image of scientists being really sure about themselves, but that's totally false. Right. It, science is about quantification of uncertainty. It's about you know, asking how well do I really know this and, and being honest when you don't know. And, 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 then, and then figuring out, okay, well, what do we need to, to do next to figure out the things that we don't know? When do you think there's going to be, do you think there's ever going to be a point where there's too many questions asked? And when you get the answers to them too, just in your field alone, Andy, how do you manage the information, regardless of what's in your brain, all of, all of the resources that we have? And you're just listening to some fundamental periodically periodicals that you can pick up at Ralph's supermarket uh, on the shelf or the app. How do you guys in this Scott field, buys his books at Ralph's. I just, just, it's, I don't, it's a great bookstore. <laughs> Ralph's. <laughs> it's a spinny rack. I got mayonnaise, but I got the, like the muscle fitness. And then I'm you can good. pick up a copy of my book. At Ralph's. Not <laughs> at Ralph's, yeah. But that's overwhelming because, it, you know, in my, my community, in the military alone, that lane, uh, we're, we're having a really difficult time with systems programs of records um, apps you know web-based services on how to manage information on and off the battlefield i can only imagine with you and your field across the country and the world for that matter those studying this field how overwhelming is it to you where you're like jesus i just cannot imagine i can swallow any more information on this information overload is a real problem everywhere in society you know whether you're talking about uh you know the the military where you guys have a background or you're talking about 
even just you know living daily life and and living in the social media world and living in a in a world where you have to have nine thousand accounts and passwords and Jesus. and you know it's going to get crazier if we survive as a civilization. Uh, the the sci fi future will have even more information overload and we will all perhaps have personalized software agents whose job it is to is to help filter that information. Hmm. You know, but that that has a whole bunch of risks as well. You know, we're we're already seeing these these software. Uh, bubbles that people live in yeah. on social media but in terms of you know how how we uh you know as scientists try to deal with this I, i've long ago learned that uh, it's impossible to know everything you know the, the best you can do is have a broad overview and then specialize in in a, in a particular few mm -hmm. corners i mean the the you know maybe 600 years ago it was possible for an educated person to know almost everything you know that was known but that ship has sailed yeah, yeah. long long ago so Anybody, and, and, and I, I think it gives me a real sense of humility because anybody who acts like they know everything, like immediately, like, that's a good put, litmus put, put, put up your yeah. bullshit filter. Because, that's a good litmus test to sniff out the imposters. Yeah. Yeah. And, that and, guy thinks he knows everything. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I think that there, there's a real uh, problem in society of people not knowing the difference between fact and opinion and speculation. Yeah. And, and the scientific worldview, it certainly has been extremely helpful to me in, in, in being able to at least know when I'm speculating and, and when I'm talking about something that's, uh, you know, something I would like to be true, but doesn't mean that it necessarily is true. Factor, yeah. factor fiction or in terms of what, what we would call in, in our community is um, information versus intelligence. Like the intelligence comes from multiple pieces of information that are vetted and verified that become fact or intelligence in, in, in yeah. our community and what we use to take actionable steps forward i can only imagine how frustrating that could be but when you say words like impossible what is possible with what you do so do you mean in terms of technology or in terms of understanding i, th I think in terms of solving the questions at hand or you say i've got three really big questions in my life that in you know the the mirror you know 80 or 90 years i'm gonna be on this planet these are the three questions i have to get answered for myself or at least pass down mm -hmm. it's a really good question i, I think that if i could uh, ask a question i might have a good I'm one sorry, man. i get around when i get around people so much smarter than me i'm like i gotta ask a bunch of questions <laughs> <laughs> pete raise your hand if you have a question <laughs> <laughs> Is, are the academic your, Pete, are the academic articles class. at Ralph's next to the shitter tickets or by the eggs? <laughs> they're on, they're in aisle eight. <laughs> aisle eight. <laughs> the literature in, in 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 any academic subfield is so large; it's impossible for any individual human to to read it and understand it at this stage. You know, the way that we kind of gather truth is by you know consensus and by the whole community being involved in 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 the peer review process. Um, where you know other other scientists are reading your work and, and then crit critiquing it and and uh, scientists are very critical of, of themselves and each other, which is I think uh, a very useful thing that would, that uh, would be it would it would better serve almost any community to not take yourself too seriously just because you thought of an idea doesn't mean it's a good one or it's true it, it needs to be to be vetted like you're, you're talking about. Um, in, in a way where you have as much uh, objectivity and impartiality as, as possible. But circling around to your question about what are the, the things that I would like to have answered, I would like to know whether or not quantum mechanics really ha captures fundamental truth about the world mm. or whether or not there is a deeper theory under the hood that uh, perhaps is more like what Einstein wanted to be true. I think that it would be really, really nice to, to know whether or not, um, this is sort of a, a side topic, uh, but it's related, but um, whether or not um, our universe, uh, the, the portion that we can access, is the only one or whether there's more. Mm. And that's actually a, a legitimate topic in theoretical physics these days. And it's a real challenging one because we don't know yet how to get direct observational evidence about other universes, which there, there are many different levels which you could talk about. But uh, th many of our best physical theories predict that our universe shouldn't be the only one. And that also influences our conception of our place in the larger scheme of things. And then I think, you know, n number three is probably uh, how did life come to evolve? How, how did we come to exist in the so first place? Super simple questions. Super simple questions. <laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, I mean, 
you know, <laughs> if, if you know, if you want to keep going, I mean, I can talk about questions. But that's the great thing, though, yeah. is that's that science has those questions. And, and it was explained to me in rudimentary terms when I was in college studying uh, philosophy of religion uh, of all faiths is why is science always trying to disprove what the Bible or uh, the Quran or the Torah say? And, and it was best explained as like it, it was the Bible in and of itself or whatever version of it you want to read is, is a great guidebook how to lead life but how do, how do you and I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Pete is like is because we, we wanted to tie this in but uh, yeah maybe this Pete's is a good got his, uh, had his hand up in the air for like 10 minutes <laughs> like, <laughs> hand down turn yeah. yeah maybe this is a good time um, to jump into is, science and religion is yeah. why why are scientists always trying to disprove what the Bible says and because there is an answer for how we were created yeah. according to whichever faith you want to choose you know pick yeah, so so you know this is this is a really really important topic. The conflict between science and, and religion has become more pronounced, you know, in the past few hundred years. It it, it wasn't always seen as a conflict. Um, you know, if you were um, an Isaac Newton or you know a, a Leibniz, you know, if you're working in the you know 1600s, you know, 1700s, people call, kind of called themselves natural philosophers. People were interested in trying to to un understand the world. And, and their place in it. And I, I think that uh, as, as uh, science has matured, uh, it, it's, it's at least clear to me that, that science and religion in their current forms serve different purposes and are trying to answer different questions about the world. And, and so, so, so I, I do think, though, that, that I, I feel very strongly about this. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure, you know, the, what religious backgrounds, you know, you guys have, but... If you're if you're thinking about uh, any uh, uh, religious text, you know the Bible, the Quran, the, the Old Testament, the Torah, you know, the, the I I I think that it is not the right uh, path to try to take those and treat them like they're science books or history books. Mm -hmm. I think that those are uh, books of of stories that were written by people to try to understand their place in the world. That at that time they've been incredibly important in human history. They're still important today. You know, and dramatically so in in various areas, uh, but that I, I think that if you want if you want to understand um, how old the Earth is, if you want to understand how old the universe is, if you want to understand why is my car not working, science is is the the best game in town to try to figure out what's actually true in in our world. Uh, but to be fair, that there are definitely questions that science can't answer and shouldn't answer. So science cannot tell you. How should I conduct myself in the world? And I'm not saying that any specific religion has a monopoly on the right answers to that. In fact, I don't, I don't actually think that there are right answers in the same way. When you're talking about an objective fact like how old is the earth? And, and we think the earth is about 4.5 billion years old. That's a very different kind of question from is it okay to kill somebody in self-defense? And, and, you know, various religions um, and spiritual belief systems would have different answers to that latter question. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that those kinds of questions are ever going to be answerable in a way that will satisfy everybody for all time. And, and I think we have to acknowledge that. So mm -hmm. I have a problem when people approach faith from a fundamentalist perspective where they think that I have the answer. My answer is the only possible answer. Everybody else who believes differently is, is not even fully human. I think that we we need to start with with acknowledging each other's humanity and and approaching all of these questions with humility because you can be an expert on mathematical theorems, you could be an expert on solving equations in physics, but n nobody has um, the same kind of expertise for religious questions, and, and so so I think that. It's it's more about having conversations. Take all the Catholics listening. No offense to your pope. No offense. That, yeah. that question also, <laughs> you could flip that path the other direction where yeah. um, the same thing is true. Like if the scientist is looking at the religious person saying, you believe in an imaginary man in the sky, ha ha, look at you, you're dumb. You could flip it around the other direction and say, you also don't have all the answers. You've got multivariate equations that you can't account for everything. You can't predict all these things. You don't know all these whys. So you're not that great of a scientist because look at you. All you have is questions. What, is, what does the zealot say? Oh, God knows the answer to that. You're, yeah. See, it's like a two-way, that's a two-way failing proposition, right? Where they, 
the, the, somewhere in between is that conversation where you're able to say there's some something else besides right or wrong at the end of the spectrum. Yeah, and I, mean, I, I, I would never approach somebody with with a belief system that's different than mine and say, you know, you're an idiot. Right. I, I don't think that's you know. But I'm not saying that you yeah. would say that. No, I'm saying yeah. In general, we we yeah. tend to. I call Pete an idiot. Though. <laughs> well, fair, fair enough. Dude, you've got to see my. That's just my sophomore but, banter. Though. But 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 I I think that uh, th there's a big misunderstanding of science in in culture in, in in the sense that the fact that scientists willingly admit our ignorance in areas where we don't know everything that's not a weakness that's yeah. a strength and unfortunately in the way people kind of conduct arguments and fights with each other in debates admitting that you don't know something is seen as as a point of weakness but i think that that that's totally misguided um and that it is a point of weakness to pretend that you know something when when you don't really know it yeah. How would you overlay what you know about this the theory of entanglement to the different religious sects? I don't even have any idea if anyone's even thought about that is are they interconnected or how come they're so vastly different based off time delineation, periods of our history, belief systems? Like how do we is, is there some way <laughs> I mean I haven't even thought about that and I've I've studied a little bit about philosophy of religion but it's just from different people's viewpoints yeah so, so i mean well pick up on the last thread you can be an expert on what various theologians and philosophers have thought about specific topics mm -hmm. over the years like it's a factual question you know saint thomas aquinas said this or whatnot but but i'm, I'm kind of more concerned with is what he said true is it verifiable is it yeah. is it provable is there is it is it based on on evidence or or is it based on um faith or, or personal feeling uh, and, and whatnot. My understanding of science and, and the truth about how the world works has definitely dramatically informed my spirituality and, and hmm. spiritual beliefs. I think that the way it works is that if somebody says that, that they have a particular idea of this is the religion I believe in and, and this, is the, the, this is what happens in this religion, if the propositions in, in that religion contradict what we know about the world from modern science, um, I would be very, very skeptical um, that, that 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 religion will take you in a good direction. But but I think that, you know, r religious and spiritual questions that are not concerned with factual details about the world or historical details about the world that are more concerned with you know, just ad ad admitting that we, we don't know the answers to everything. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how to conduct ourselves in the world, how to you know, for example, how to do good in the world, if that's, if that's you know, one of the driving uh, themes in your religion. I think th those are religious questions that can be informed by, by science. So there, there's a sense in which science, I think, can and should underlie every religious faith in the sense that it's, it's, it's your reality check. And if you're asking about questions like, is there an afterlife? Uh, you know, or uh, if you're asking about the nature of God, I think that knowledge of science can only helpfully inform the, those discussions, and and but you, you got to be willing to accept that sometimes maybe you want something to be true, and hmm. modern scientific understanding will throw some cold water on that. You know, so and and, and if, if we can circle back to this sort of question of, let's say, if you're asking a scientist, do you believe in God or not? I I think, and I understand where that's coming from for sure, but I think it's really important that. Uh, we realize that this is arguably the most interesting question of all time, hmm. and it is not fair to turn it into a yes or no question. Yeah. Because if we talk about, like, the definition of God, I'm sure that, that if we broke it down, uh, whatever you believe in, whatever you believe in, whatever I believe in, we would have different definitions. Yeah. So it's not fair to just, we're comparing apples and oranges, and if you really sat down with, with any anybody in the world, um, the real question I think we should be asking is, what's your definition or what's what's the definition of God that you can that you can defend personally like that, that you 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 personally believe in and and in, in, in that sense I, I think that you, you want to move past this this sort of question of you know well my God concept is different than yours therefore you know you're an atheist or yeah. or, or, or you're, not, you're not even a real I, human I think that it is not possible for for an individual person to have the right answer to that question but don't you think the public, most people are more binary than people like you that understand yes. that there's never going to be right, wrong, yes, no to these people want certainty and, and, and people, yeah. people, you know, human nature 
likes to see the world in black and white sometimes, but that's not how reality is. And, yeah. and, and I think that we'd be better served by uh, developing the skills to, to acknowledge that. You've developed a certain level of wisdom by being a researcher and you accept that. Well, first off, every, every academic paper starts with the shit that you're not trying to explain and parameters and caveats. Like before we, okay, here's a lit review. Here's an abstract. Here's what we aren't trying to do. Here's what we don't know. All these things are eliminated and you're talking about one very specific thing. And then if we look at religious text, I mean, we found a bunch of scrolls in a cave and that's like one of the most important <laughs> findings ever. And you mentioned Thomas Aquinas earlier, what, like one of the best philosophers of all time. What if he was a shitty writer and he's like, I can't explain, like, you know, we're getting the best of what he could write in that time. What if he took his text today? Would he go, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Or we'd be like, I've had 500 years to think about this and 80% solution. You know, like you've written a book, you probably could go back and make 500 words change in that book right now. Right. So you take these texts that are imperfect and don't have the context of today in it. And we're trying to make them more than what you could make an academic article out of. I mean, a peer reviewed article would be like, you know, it's just the best in the time that we have right now. And yeah, there's thoughts that have advanced already. There, there's a lot to unpack in that question. And in, in, in any kind of a, of a scientific process, knowledge is always provisional. Um, an individual paper is never the final word. Right. Like you should always be willing in science to update your beliefs based on new evidence. So when I think about historical religious texts, um, I, I very strongly reject the idea that there are certain truths that 2,000 years ago we understood perfectly and that they can never change in the future. I think that the, the only spiritual and religious belief system that I can support is one that's willing to evolve and update itself as we learn more and more about the world. And the, the uh, so, so I, I just, I don't think there was ever a golden age in the past where, you know, we, we, we had the monopoly on truth for these do you, questions. Do you compare religions like that? Uh, I don't know, open to either one of you. Is, yeah. is there a religious belief or belief system that says, oh, they are just stuck, lockstep, I would never be part of that congregation, that church, that belief system, or this is the best one, you weigh those out. Have you ever changed religions? Uh, no, I, I, I guess, I mean, my, my, my own background is, is uh, in Reform Judaism. Um, and the, the um, I, I, have, I haven't changed religions, but I wouldn't say that I, that I you know, believe everything that other people yeah, in, in that religion believe. Mine's just lay cards on the table since mm -hmm. yeah. we're showing our dicks here. Is uh, <laughs> Episcopalian, which is like Catholicism light, you know, all yeah. religion, half the guilt, but my belief too has changed through my experiences and my knowledge to accept or not accept certain aspects of what that religion taught me. And I, I say that in a parochial sense, because it, whether it's Judaism or Catholicism or being a Protestant, like they teach you, this is how it should be. And along the course of my life and also through science, which, you know, there's things that say, no, nah, not necessarily, man, you need to make your own decisions. I'm suspect of religious belief systems that are dogmatic. I think that uh, word of the day. Dogmatic. This episode brought to you by dogmatic.com. <laughs> the best kibble on the market. In, indeed. But but uh, in, in, in Reform Judaism, at least, one of the things that I've appreciated is that it's, it's, it, it's very much a question asking faith in the sense that it's not about you must believe this set of things or else. It, it's, it's, it's about constantly questioning and challenging and interestingly it's 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 one of the faiths in the world that i think is is most consistent with the the scientific worldview um in in the sense that uh i've never run into a situation where i had some religious teaching from my childhood and and like i encountered some scientific truth that contradicted it and i had a crisis of faith you ever sit in the lab and you're banging your head against the computer screen for a question you're like god help me find the answer to this does that ever bother you well, I, I, I think that, that provide the answers. I mean, I don't know. Well, I, I, I personally don't don't believe in a God that is interventionist in that way. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, the, I understand absolutely the appeal uh, of, of wanting to have a, a personal God that you can talk to and have a personal relationship with. Well, it's called a faith based system for one, that reason. It's funny right? that you say that. Cause I, I'm reading Tim McIntosh Smith's. 3,000 year history of the Arabs. 
And obviously a lot of that is Islamic faith. And this, and as much as, and again, this goes right back to your thing earlier, as much as I know about the literature in the international world and the Islamic world, the Orient, all those areas, you know, this guy can write a book and I'm, I'm back in grade school, you know, learning. And he's like, hmm. Islam is about surrender, does not require faith. And it changes how they look at politics and everything. And, it, and I'm like, I, I never knew that, never understood that. So when we, and also let's also, uh, going back to the religious text thing, how many, how, when will someone write the final translation of what the Bible is or the Torah is? Like when you translate it from the original language to the new one, I mean, it gets constantly. That's, 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 we've already answered those questions here on this episode. Well, well, well that's, well, <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's a good question though, because if somebody is trying to claim that, let's say the King James Bible yeah. written in English right. is the final truth in some regard or in all regards, we have to acknowledge the history of the fact that the Bible was, I think, written in Aramaic first yeah. and translated to Hebrew and Greek and yeah. no translation process is perfect. So even if, and I, and I don't grant this, that you grant the first book was, you know, handed down, you know, by God himself on Mount Sinai. Yeah. Perfect. It, 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 it has been altered in many ways. So we, we, we have to be humble about, I think, how we interpret these texts. And it is just the wrong path to treat them as the, the literal truth. And s some of the things, some of the stories that, that, that we read in any of these religious texts, um, I think for good reasons, we would look at, at you know, our modern day sense of morality and say, look, you know, I understand the historical context, yeah. but, but I'm not OK doing the, the things that were done. You know, I don't think those are morally right anymore. So, so, yeah. so you have to have, in my opinion, a, an, an evolving view. That these texts are not static. If I was some holy roller Southern Baptist came yeah. in, so like the 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 heck it didn't come down from Mount Sinai. Meditation. Like, what book you've been reading? Like, you get this guy rolling yeah. in, and you're thinking, I'm a super educated guy. Yeah. I know all of this information. You're absolutely wrong. What do you say to that guy? Or can you can you just say, I accept you for who you are. You're misinformed. You don't have all the information. I mean, because I, I, I think that, that it's it's a really okay. you don't want to offend people like that. No, no. And, and, and ultimately, here's how I, I, I wish that no offense to Southerners out there, because I just a really bad Southern accent. But, fair, fair enough. Yeah, I, and, 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 Foghorn Lake, honey. I, 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 I said, Pete, Pete, I, I, I quantum <laughs> gas in order. You're sticking up the joint. I, I, I really wish that uh, we approach these these religious issues as discussions, yeah. not as debates. So when something is a debate or an argument, it's a zero sum game where there's one winner and one loser. And you're trying to say, my view of the world is correct. Yours is wrong. And I'm going to bend you to my will. Yeah, and, and you have to submit. Outlook. And, and, uh, but I think that that is absolutely the wrong framework for these kinds of questions. For certain factual questions, if you're like, who is the director of this 1984 movie? Sure, there is an answer, you know, and, and somebody might be wrong and, and you can have an argument well, about I, that I think by and then fact that, check it. Using that subtle difference in verbiage that you just eloquently stated is debate versus discussion. I think in any field where we're talking religion, sciences, yeah. that breeds harmony with what we're trying to achieve. And I think as a modern society, a very young society, with everything that we've got going on, we, we shifted gears from talking about politics and, and, and things of that with Victoria Tapp on the, on the previous episode and then going into this. But I think all of those things with what we're dealing with in this country now, th that element of, you know, harmony between political parties or through systems or planets or galaxies. I mean, having a discussion vice a debate, I think setting that at, at the at the front of the stage absolutely really sets the tone for how you move forward. I think that there are so many issues in society that we should be approaching from a discussion mentality and not a debate mentality. I'm in, totally going to steal that. In, in, in a discussion, the goal is to share your views, but also to learn what the other people are thinking, to really listen, to accept the fact that your, your worldview might change mm -hmm. in response to new evidence and new information from other people. In, in a discussion, there's the potential that everybody wins. In, in a debate, you might think that there's a winner, but I think everybody loses. If you take a topic that is a discussion topic and turn it into a fight, everybody loses. Even even yeah. even the, the 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 person who's viewed as the winner 
loses in a, in this in a, in a situation like that. So it's, it's, I want to jump in because mm-hmm. also I don't even know if debate is the right term because really what we're describing is an argument because a debate has an external assessor who's hopefully impartial who says this is this is the answer that is the better answer of the two questions. Well, if you're talking about like a, a debate contest that's judged by somebody, right? I understand what you mean, but but I'm using debate and argument synonymously. So if yeah. if, if you and I are having an argument and we're the but only two people in the room, the argument and you said. Like this whole thing with Iran and and America, I've got specific knowledge about this. So if I bring in specific knowledge, do you have the capability of having your mind changed? And if it's no, then there's no point in having this conversation. Like that, that's more of a th- that's the a challenge format, right? The the if if somebody is not 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 willing to change their mind based on new information and new evidence, they are stuck in the argument mentality yeah. and um. I, 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 I think we would all be better served, whether we're talking about religion, politics, uh, of having it be a discussion mentality. I, I, I mean, evidence th- being based on fact, which is also important, which we don't get fed to us from our information sources. Sadly, there are so many huge problems when it comes to how do you trust what's what information sources yeah. that, yeah. you know, you get your, your media from in the world. And, and just, you know, I mean diverting to politics just for a second, I think that we have these presidential debates. That's an issue where in politics, you know, if somebody's saying, well, I think that we should raise taxes by this amount and someone's saying, well, I think we should actually, you know, not raise taxes. That's a question that doesn't have a right answer. It depends on what you're optimizing for. That's the kind of question you can only have a discussion about. When things are framed in terms of debates, everybody loses. Let me take us back to the quantum world. And Mm -hmm. I want to throw out a concept and kind of play with that. If quantum entanglement appears to be what it is, you know, we all have some kind of connection. I mean, that connection could, I guess, ultimately be God, but it also might apply to love. Yes, we can look at chemical reactions in the brain and say that's what triggers love, but there's still, can I be more entangled with you or can I be a power entangler? Like you think about people that gather massive groups of people, you know, where they just are more sticky than someone who's obstinate or whatever, you know, can you, can you be more entangled and be able to build a congregation more easily because you just have this quantum capability that's a, you know, two orders higher than the standard entanglement? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Can you be more entangled and be able to build a congregation more easily because you just have this quantum capability that's a you know two orders higher than the standard entanglement well i i I think we need to step back a little so the the way that that we use the word entanglement in a Mm -hmm. in a technical sense is very different than the way we would think about entanglement uh, between people and individuals or um in in the broader culture right it's definitely true that if quantum mechanics is a you know a description of the world that it's at least approximately true then entanglement is a widespread phenomenon right uh but the 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 thing that i think is is important um where where we can get led astray a little bit with the analogy is that in the experiments that that we're doing we're talking about systems that are um close to maximally entangled in the sense that they are as uh inseparable um as as you can imagine so when i measure one thing i learn as much as i possibly can about the other those systems by by definition are very very special and isolated from the environment. And you need that to build new quantum technologies in, in computation and in encryption and communications and all sorts of things like that. But if you're talking about just entanglement in, in the world uh, on the physical level, entanglement gets spread and diluted very quickly. So, you know, if, if there's air molecules that are hitting me, mm-hmm. they become entangled with, you know, my shirt, but then air molecules are bouncing off a bunch of other air molecules so the information that that air molecule had about like, you know, the temperature of my shirt or something like that, it gets diluted very, very rapidly. So there's a sense in which it is true that everything is entangled with everything else at some level. But for things that are, are uh, far apart from each other in space and time, it, it gets dramatically diluted. There's a theorem that's called the monogamy of entanglement. So if you got two systems that are maximally entangled with each other, 
neither of them can be entangled at all with anything else in, in the quantum mechanical sense. You can have three-party entanglement or multi-party entanglement, but it, it, gets, it gets spread really thin. So, so, so I think that, and I totally understand your question, you know, in terms of the analogy between how you can talk about people, in, you know, different parts of the world being connected with each other in important ways. And we absolutely are connected with each other, you know, based on our, our shared history together and, and shared culture. But, but I would hesitate on, on trying to extend the, the quantum analogy, you know, too far. I don't know if that's a, a satisfying answer, but. Well, well, there's also like when you look at, you know, the big religious based philosophers and, you know, it, a lot of times in time, they're, they're not that far apart, maybe 150 years in their terms of their lives. Maybe their lives even overlapped, but they have no knowledge of each other. Yet they come up with very similar concepts in wildly different cultures. Do you think, is there any kind of a quantum religion or quantum love or quantum connection that allows humans to think almost like a network and, and come up with these concepts that are impossible? Like, yeah, there's 500,000 people on the planet at that time. And there's going to be some random, like we all had the same great idea. Let's say that you had two planets that provably never had any communication with each other. And, and there was never a third party earlier in the history of the universe that communicated with either of these planets. Right. And they independently, multiple times on each planet, people on different islands, you know, that never talked with each other, right. came up with exactly the same religious text about the universe. Yeah. If we lived in a world like that, then I think religious texts would have a different meaning and standing. But we don't. All, all religious texts that have you know, been invented um, are very different from each other. They're, to the extent that they have commonalities, that's usually based on um, a previous religion that, that you know, two texts did sure. communicate with and, and both derived from. So, so for example, you know, in, in, um, in Greek and Norse mythology have lots of things in common, probably because there was an earlier mythology right. that, that uh, you know, the three fates or the three norns, you know, sure. the stories like that. Before Jesus, there was they, Dionysus, all that kind of stuff. So, so, so if you have a common cause, a common origin, right. um, it, it's, it's very much understandable in a, in a causal framework how, how these things came to be. Um, but I, I, I would say to you that the kind, the kind of truth that science is about discovering in the world is, is the kind of truth that these two civilizations on these independent planets that never met really could independently hmm. their science textbooks in the areas where they they research the same topic would overlap to a large extent you know one civilization might be ahead of the other there might be some things that that were understood by one and not the other and vice versa but where they overlapped you you would get this convergence because you're you're dealing with objective truth in the world in, in a different way and I, and i think that that we really need to consider that that that's not in my opinion what religion should be about when you're talking about how should I conduct myself in the world? Let, let's say, what am I optimizing for? Am I optimizing for um, human happiness? Am I optimizing for lack of suffering? Am I optimizing for material wealth, which is the religion that, <laughs> that, that, uh, that we have in, in modern society yeah. in, in many, many uh, areas? I mean, you, 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 there isn't an objective answer to what should I be optimizing for? I don't know who, who said this, but there was a a philosopher who said, you know, you can't derive an ought from an is. Mm. From the way the world is, you cannot um, then say, therefore, the world should be this way. So, so I, I think that we, we need to acknowledge with, with humility that um, the kinds of questions we're dealing with uh, in, mm. in religion and spirituality are the kinds of questions that merit discussions. And they're not the kinds of questions that uh, anyone has absolute authority to, to the answer on. Everybody undergoes their own spiritual, personal struggle, you know, and as a society, we, we, we try to evolve, you know, a moral consensus about certain issues, you know, so for example, most people in the modern world think that it's, it's not okay to just murder somebody just because that wasn't always true in, in human civilization. I think that's moral progress. That's my own personal, you know, belief and, and but, but, but that, that comes, you know, for, from discussion over time. When you look at, let's just take Reform Judaism, is that if it's truly Reform Judaism, you can almost call it Freestyle Judaism, where you're allowed to reform and educate and learn and evolve, or does Reform lock in and then there has to be a new Reform Judaism that's called something else? I, I, I understand your question. Yeah. I mean, if at, at any given time, you know, like 
in, in Judaism today, there's, you know, Orthodox Judaism, there's conservative, there's Reconstructionist, there's reform. Right. You know, and any particular movement is not a monolithic thing. Right. People believe different things within that movement. Sometimes things split off. So, 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 you know, the Methodist church is now splitting off into right. two denominations, you know, and, and, you know, I, I think that, uh, that, that, that is inevitable for any, any religion that wants to survive and thrive. You have to be able to evolve. You have to be able to change. You have to be able to update your, your beliefs based on new evidence. And, you know, so, so for example, you know, the, the, the split in the Methodist church is, is based on whether or not you accept uh, gay people or not. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, that you shouldn't discriminate against anybody because of sexual preference. And so, so but, but I, but I, you know, I, I understand that, that uh, there are lots of people who, who feel differently. And I think religious freedom is, is important, but uh, it, especially in, in areas like this, separation of church and state is really important because if you have a state-sponsored religion, for example, it's based on this false idea that there is a right answer to these to these <laughs> yeah, questions, yeah. and and you know it's really a mechanism of power and control as opposed to wanting to understand the human condition and our place in the universe, and that that that's where I think positive religious and spiritual growth can happen when we're we're, we're constantly having discussions about how can we conduct ourselves in the world. What about the pace of science and technology and, and advancement? You know, like you guys are going in, and you know, as, as you go through the scientific growth process, oftentimes you get into a smaller and smaller silo or a small, you know, your sphere becomes smaller because there's just like, so you can't know it all. Right. But it does seem like religion, you have time to reflect and go back. And I mean, how many, you know, theologians read a lot of the old books over and over and over again, and they get more knowledge out of that. I mean, people still read Sun Tzu for crying out loud, you know, a thousand years later or more. Um, and then in our world, you know, if you don't, if you can't talk intelligently about Clausewitz, you know, it means you haven't read it 50 times. So science, and not that you guys don't spend time in older things, but there is that forward, 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 forward thing. Is science missing some of that reflection where you can really pull something more out of the data? Like you guys are still working your data from the cosmic bell test, I'm sure. But at some point you do move on or no? The, 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 there are a few things that we can do with, with that data that we haven't done yet. But yeah, it's, at some point, um, you know, you, you, you move on to the next project, which, you know, can definitely be a, a natural extension of, yeah. uh, of, of that project. Where like if you go to like a, a Methodist church, they got the same main text and they continue to go through it. And then they do like side projects with the book of Job and all these, you know, over and over and over again. I think that, uh, again, this is, you know, circling back to a yeah. point we've covered a little bit, but that. I think it's it's really important that we should look at that religious texts as something that can and should evolve, and our interpretations of them can and should evolve as we learn more and more about the world. It's incredibly uh, important to to have humility on all these issues. To, to to say that my religious text was perfect, you know, many years ago in the past, yeah, and I'm just revisiting it, and um. You know, that's that's the path towards stagnation in, yeah. in a religion. I think if a religion wants to stay modern and vibrant, it has to evolve. I like your cold water theory is that whether we're talking about information or religion or science is that even the answers that we provide or the, the faith or the comfort that we get out of something can change in the future. And it could be from the next brilliant 33 year old genius out of MIT saying, Hey, you know, that theory you thought was so great. Check this out. There's new technology that says this, or we just found this hidden scroll in a cave yeah. and it now tells us this. And if you're not willing to accept that and everything is, is finite, just like the answer, yes or no, which is finite or winner or loser finite. Uh, I think that you, you really shed a lot of light on that. Just answer it. Just, just explaining that cold water theory is like, Hey, you always got to be, Looking out for that because someone's going to throw it in your face eventually if you just hit the end, hit the end of the road. So, I mean, so really brilliant. Thank you. And yeah. and and I and I don't know, like, uh, you know, if if uh, if you guys would agree with us, you know, with with your background in the military, you know, at, at a certain level, let's say you have some idea about you know the way things are on the ground, you know, um, you might be wrong, and you, it's a, it's cold a water that's a absolute recipe for disaster. Cold cold oh, water yeah. might might be thrown in a disastrous way. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I guess the thing is that 
if you approach the situation where you're so incredibly sure of what you're going to find, I think that's that's that can be very dangerous. It's 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 important, you know, in in all aspects of life, but especially in literal life and death mm-hmm. situations to 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 acknowledge the uncertainty. We've been pounding you for an hour about religion, you know, but this should be a discussion. What questions do you have for us? I love the idea of asking people, what is your definition of God? You know, what, what do you actually believe? And it's not the kind of thing that, that uh, you know, you have to go out on a limb and, and share all your beliefs if, if you don't want to. But, uh, you know, what do you believe now and, and has, has it evolved over your lifetime? I know for me, it has evolved. I was raised in a Presbyterian church with some Baptist thrown in there. My dad has... Uh, when he was alive, he had a degree, master's in divinity. So I had a lot of exposure to a lot of different churches and and a whole lot of church. And I'm thankful for that. I mean, it was great. It's great to be able to talk intelligently and without passion about it because I've seen a lot of different varieties. Um, But when I think about God, I think about science and looking for planets. You know, when we first were trying to figure out, like, maybe the sun gets a little darker when it goes by. You can't look directly at it, can't really see it but you can tell it's there. So that's sort of how I look like you can tell me there's no God, but explain silent night, explain the Duomo, explain all these incredible things that were inspired by God. If it's inspired by God, then there is a God, you know, I just can't put my finger on who, what, or how it is. But I accept that if I think that there isn't a God, I don't have the data to prove that. It's like, I don't have the data to prove that there is. So I'm sort of not hedging, but I'm, I accept that. There's so many things that I don't know anything about. Yeah, there's some kind of, of course, there's some kind of higher being that has a better knowledge or capacity. We certainly aren't the, by the way we act day to day, we are not the apex creature or existence out there, you know, can't be. Absolutely not. I I guess what I, what I would challenge you to do. Uh, moving forward, you know, is this a homework assignment? It is. I thought it is. Are, are we getting some stipend as research subjects, <laughs> yes. like from the university? I need mean, a, a Starbucks coffee card. Are we going to get a coupon? And 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 and, and th- th- this this is you know this is not like a a you know afternoon homework assignment. This yeah. is this is a lifetime assignment, oh, which okay, is good. which is to try try to you know fully articulate to the extent that you can, you know what what is your definition of, of God, and yeah. you know because I you know I. I, I understand that nobody has fully thought that question through. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, people can give answers of, of varying precision, but that the whole process and the whole individual struggle is, is I think, more of the point than arriving at a, at a specific answer that is going to be correct. You know, and, and, and uh, you know, so, so I mean, I, I throw the same question over to you. Well, my... My upbringing and background, I think that has has changed and evolved based off of life experiences and 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 people and and Pete, I believe you just asked me this question on an episode or, or someone mm. did was asking me about my faith, and I told them how it had changed from again the very parochial up down Neil Ben here's the book ring the bells genuflecting all that, and not really taking that on board is what religion is uh not that there's this omnipotent being that's going to answer all the questions that is interventionist i i've really pulled away from that just because of what i've seen the church evolve into as more of a organized religion for money where these large organizations are you know cat herding you know thousands of people into the congregations and milking them for funds and then you see all the some of the not ethical things or what I call ways how not to live your life of what the church and these institutions are doing. So I've lost faith in that. I will say that, but that's institutional. It doesn't mean I don't have faith in other things, but what I've told people for the most part, and I've gone on record of saying this is my religion. If I had to say I have a religion now is in people is in my faith is in people that Ultimately, if you are, are good at heart and you, you believe in other people, that you have a, a strong network. And when you want to talk about entanglement or connectivity, and I don't know if those two words are synonymous in your world, but those are the things that really make us evolve as well as, as, as human beings through generations um, or eras or even our own lifetimes, as minuscule as that in the, in the drop of sand of of this planet in 4.5 billion years so i think that that is what 
on a daily basis, if I'm thinking about a God, I'm thinking about something has brought us together. And my faith lies in those people that share that type of message of just basic human kindness and doing more for other people that they can't do for themselves. I think that's really the tenant that I would, I guess if I had a Bible, it would probably be only a pamphlet. You know, I don't need scrolls and thick textbooks to tell me that because that's what I feel. And I think that you should feel that in your daily life is like, you know, I feel this way and people struggle with that. I feel this way or or religion tells me this and science of this, but I really want to believe this. Mm -hmm. So where do you put your faith? What is your real faith? If you're, being force fed certain information, but you act a different way. But mine, mine to answer your question would be that's, I think that's the broadest definition I could give of my God. If there had to be one, I would want to add uh, an annex a to mine too, is because of my experience, this, this is important. It's yeah. in a way I've evolved that didn't really hurt me right away, but um, I'm okay with your God, you know, whether it's a philosophical God, a spiritual God, you know, I mean, obviously I'm not okay with the God that, you know, does harmful things to people on purpose, you know, as a norm, but um, yeah, whatever. I mean, I've, I've met a lot of wonderful Baptists, Islamists, I mean, of all stripes, you know, and ultimately, you know, people, people are good people, you know, and, and what the faith is sort of like the kind of t-shirt they wear. And if I get mad because someone's got a different t-shirt on, then Who's the asshole, you know? Well, you know, it's interesting what, what Andy said, too, is he, he, your religion has evolved during one point in our civilization. It was all right to kill another human being. We thought that was all right. And if you're thinking about the larger scheme or the supreme being that creates everything and we're all equal as animals, murder and killing of others that are inferior, that's, that's the animal kingdom. We are part of that animal kingdom, but we've put almost like we've held ourselves to a higher standard as we've evolved and had these cultural norms and societal norms placed on us. So does that make a religion better or worse? I don't know. Thank you guys for sharing. No, I, I, I certainly appreciate it. The, there, there's so much to unpack in, in what, what both of you guys said. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you like, and, I think what he gets likes best is we can go from Looney Tunes uh-huh. cartoon characters yeah. from like, you know, sophomore to... Right. Well, I was just Probably. thinking when you, in Looney Tunes, I was thinking about <laughs> rabbits and have rabbits evolved <laughs> religiously and, and so, you know, like, do they have a conscious and are they better rabbits than they were yeah. 300 years ago? I don't know. Yeah. It is a I, lot. Yeah, it is a lot to unpack, but it's re- really good stuff, man. I'm like grateful for it's, your time. It's always fun, yeah. you know, talking about this stuff. And, you know, I mean, and, and I think that, you know, this is an example of a of a true discussion, you yeah. know, where, where it's it's like, even if I may believe different things than, than either or both of you, we have points in common. And I think that the fundamental thing is to, you know, we're starting from a point of acknowledging each other's humanity. Everybody's here on this world struggling, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. That's right. Like, what, what should I be doing with my life? How should I treat other people? And, and you know, I, I did want to, you know, jump back to focusing on, you know, connections with other people. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, and, and I can share a little bit about my own personal spiritual beliefs. So the, the, uh, the, the, the thing that I think science can help us most about is not telling us what what God is, but telling us what God probably is not. Hmm. Um, and it, it, in my own personal beliefs, I'm not saying that I, I have the answer or I'm an authority on this, but um, I don't think that God is a person. So I, I, I cannot uh, subscribe to a belief system where God is an individual being. If you're talking about the standard, you know, Judeo-Christian definition of, you know, an omnipotent, you know, all-knowing, all-powerful, eternal God, who's most likely a dude um, who, who uh, created the universe and, and is responsible for providing meaning. Um, you know, I, I, I don't believe in, in that, but I do believe in it. So I don't believe in a personal God that you can have a personal relationship with. And I understand, though, why so many people want that to be true. And, and I would never call somebody, you know, stupid or, you know, for, for wanting that. It, it's, it's part of our nature to, to want connection with others, to, to want to create meaning in the world. But I think that it's really important to me that, that this meaning is not provided to us by something external to us. We are responsible for creating the, the meaning in our lives. It doesn't mean that, that, that life is meaningless if it's not handed to you. In fact, it's much more meaningful when you earn it. So, so I, I think a spiritual struggle is something that, that everybody has to you know, undertake um, you know, in their lifetime and, and some people struggle more, some people struggle less, but I think that's, that's the most valuable thing that, that you can do. 
and and to 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 realize that you got to approach it with humility and you got to understand that personal relationships are real in the sense of other people the the we don't need to look any further than the people around us to think about making a personal connection and and so so i i i i feel similarly you know to what you were saying in terms of um having faith in people, having faith in, in the fundamental goodness of people. Now, obviously, he, people in, in certain circumstances can do awful and terrible things. So, so I'm, I'm interested in, in how do we get to a world where the, the, the better angels of our nature, so to speak, are, are expressed more often. And I really do think that if we lived in a society that was structured around discussion instead of argument for issues that are not objective, <laughs> you know, we we would we would do much much better as a civilization. I think we made a misstep when we developed monotheism, and I'm not saying that polytheism is an answer, but like an omni omni god, it causes too much strife and struggle. We're on an Euler diagram, you know, and uh, you know you know what an Euler diagram is for the audience. They don't picture a Venn diagram, but with even more stuff on the on the thing. So there's a whole bunch of circles and squares and different shapes. So. If you have a, let's just say, a multi-theistic approach to life, it doesn't mean that I have to worship your God, you know, or, or their God or whatever, but I can't accept that Odin was a God, Titan was a God, you know, Ahura Mazda was a God, or is a God, I guess I should say more accurately. And, and then it's like, yeah, there's, there's room for your God, there's room for my God, and if you don't choose our team, we're all in the same rec softball league, you know, we all, we're all going to go drink beer afterwards, and, and yeah, to think that I have the only God, well... Again, who's the asshole? This also brings, you know, uh, things around to the question of like when somebody tries to frame the the it, as a debate, like you know, are you an atheist or are you a believer? Really, when it comes down to it, everybody believes in something. Yeah, it's just a question of of articulating it and being <laughs> being honest about your assumptions and being honest about what you want to be true. So it's totally unfair in modern society to, you know, the word the word atheist has negative connotations to label somebody an atheist. Because their definition of God is different than yours. Because if we're really honest, everybody's definition is a little bit different mm -hmm. or a lot different, you know, in, in, in certain cases. Yeah. And so, so you know, I, I don't believe in, in a God who is a person. I think that's the wrong category. But I don't think that I'm an atheist just because there are other people who do believe in a personal God. So it's a really complicated question. Yeah. Do you believe in God? And I think that we, we got to get away from the, the simplistic uh, yes or no question. It's just, it's not in that category. Well, even, I mean, if you really look at etymology and what atheism, atheism is, it doesn't mean that there isn't a God. You know, you can argue about the definition of atheism. I mean, we can't decide what the definition <laughs> of culture is or any number of words. Yes. So just to say it's that, it's just, again. Dude, you, the, you, before we walked into this, because get ready to have your mind blown. <laughs> Andy I'm like, right now I'm thinking like, where do prayers go if there's not? <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> like, think about that. Like, yeah. it's like you know, like all these people. Are, I'm not saying that prayer is bad, but yeah. even if you're an atheist, like, you can't hope for anything. Yeah. Like, you call <laughs> hope is what we call prayer. So yeah. you can't hope for shit anymore. <laughs> like, well, I, well, I mean, we geez, franchised like, it. Mind yeah. officially blown, right, right there. <laughs> Happy to help. And <laughs> and 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 uh, you know, let's say you're talking about the subject of of prayer. Yeah. I, I think that that uh, it, it has always served like a, a very useful need for people, um, and and I totally understand the the desire to to want to have a larger, higher power that's out there that's answering your prayers. Um, may, maybe it's as simple as like I'm in pain and I want it to stop, or you know, the, please help me out with something, or or you're being more altruistic and saying my friend is in trouble please help them you know and those are totally normal and, and natural thoughts and i understand that that uh, you know it, it's it's very challenging if you're somebody who believes that um, you're you're having a conversation with somebody who a being who might potentially answer you and help you um, then then um, you know it's it's a very very uh, um, different worldview to to think that well if if that's not true then yeah. Prayer is, is a form, in my view, of internal self-reflection and, and clarifying what you'd like to be true about the world. Doesn't necessarily mean that it is true. Sometimes your prayers get answered, but I don't think it's because of the prayers. Unless you um, say, you know, I want this to be true, and then 
it starts a process by which you take actions in the world that help make it more likely to become true. How much of religion is human instinct? Because you look at instincts in animals, butterflies should have, they have no brain at all. You know, they just have a a system that flaps wings, but there they go, milkweed, all the way up Northern California for the monarch, you know? Mm -hmm. There's no way they could know these things. They know when they're north and they change their bodies to be more wooly so they can survive in the colder climate. Pods of whales, you know, they the way penguins behave there's so many things and we're part of like as scott said Mm -hmm. a part of the animal kingdom is is religion a byproduct of an instinct to cluster to you know focus our our emotional energy and we don't know that we're doing it we just we just do it yeah i think i think that the answer is probably yes and i'm I'm not an expert on this particular topic but a lot of people have talked about you know evolution and uh you know the, the the biological evolution and the kinds of religious sensibilities that it predisposed mm. us towards uh, versus, you know, and there's also the cultural evolution aspect of, sure. of religion as well. But, but, but I do think that, that, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as mammals, um, you know, who all of us had a mother and a father to, at the beginning, whether we grew up with them or not, you know, it's, it's very, very natural to model our God after parental figures. Yeah. And I think that's an evolutionary uh, byproduct. Mm. Um, and you know, we, 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 we're very social creatures. We, we, we talk to each other. We talk to, that's how we make our way in the world. And it's very, very natural to extend those kinds of social instincts to the wider universe, yeah. whether or not there is a conscious being at the other end. It's, it's very, very natural to, to see in the weather, in the trees, in, in the natural world, visions of ourself. But, but I, I worry about us trying to create a God in our own image. Um, and I, I worry that we have causality reversed. Hmm. So, you know, the, the, another thing that I think is, is really important is, is this, this idea of, of personal responsibility in the sense that, Mm -hmm. um, there is no right answer in my opinion for what is the meaning of life? What should I, you know, what should I do in the world? You know, and I, I think that it's a mistake to try to outsource that answer to something external to yourself or something that you were taught when you were a child. I think you have to struggle with it with personally. And, um, but, but there, there is meaning in the world, but it's meaning that we create through discussion and through struggle and through suffering and through, um, all, all the things that we have to endure. And, and that's the world is, it, it's not just as simple, you know, as like, Oh, either you believe in this faith or the world is meaningless. I think that's, that's ridiculous. You know, we, 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 uh, we create meaning in the world. In, in, in a certain sense, um, you know, Carl Sagan was a, a scientist and a, a science communicator who said this really eloquently. He said, you know, we are the eyes and ears of the cosmos. We are the means by which, you know, a universe can come to understand itself, even if there, there isn't a personal God that, that created it that's outside the universe. You know, and, and I mean, ultimately, one way of kind of talking about my, my spiritual beliefs is that I don't believe in anything that's supernatural. And by that, I mean... Um, that, that is magic that, that, uh, uh, breaks the laws of physics, whatever they may be. Uh, I think that everything that takes place takes place within the context of, of the natural world. So, so I, I cannot believe in a supernatural being that exists separate from and independent of, of, of the world. The only kind of God I could believe in is something that is d- directly part of the world. And, and I don't believe God is a person, but I, believe personhood exists all around us Mm -hmm. so so you know if if you were talking about a uh a very simplified you know idea i would say that that the kind of god i can believe in is you know the 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 collective meaning um that is brought into being by the efforts of conscious beings all throughout the universe whether they're us whether they're aliens whether they're you know (laughs) the the evolutionary descendants of chimpanzees in in a million years aliens (laughs) Wrap your head around that one. I'm gonna be listening to this one again <laughs> on replay. Listen to Andy, and I'm gonna like I'm gonna do it sober, and then mm-hmm. let's do it drunk again. Yeah, like, that ever, sounds do, reasonable. Do you ever do quantum entanglement over beers or like booze, hard liquor? I mean, is that it, bad? that's probably bad? Huh? It, Writing it, drunk it, it is. Bad. It, it is extremely common in physics to is it? <laughs> to, to to mix the two together. I'm gonna make a voodoo Andy doll and. <laughs> 
not put pins in it because that's not what kind of guy I am. But I'm going to put it in front of a computer monitor and I'm going to make a little throne out of marshmallows. That sounds that sounds like a lot more humane version yeah. of, of a give you something to snack voodoo. on and like your little spiritual Andy thing. And that way, if someone does make a bad Andy doll, then you know you'll have a counterbalance. That's true. So the the pins would you know from somebody else using the voodoo You'd in the wrong like, I'll way. I'll take those and make they'd s'mores. get stuck in the marshmallows. Exactly. Yes, I saw the the latex doll you have made of John. Yeah. <laughs> John, if you're listening, man, that that ain't cool. The mouth, though, it's so nice. <laughs> hey, man, thanks for coming on the show. So and absolutely, do yeah. more of it.